All right, so um, I'm here talking with Tom Jump, and um, Tom is an atheist, and uh, Tom, you have a YouTube presence, um, over 10,000 subscribers, so uh, that's pretty healthy YouTube uh, following. And uh, for those who might be tuning into this conversation before having seen the other one, this is actually a follow-up conversation. Um, Tom had reached out to me, uh, asked if he could interview me on his channel, and uh, we did that, and we talked for a while, and had a good conversation. I found Tom to be uh, a uh, respectful and thoughtful conversation partner, um, but the conversation was live, and his fans were um, kind of, let's say, distracting, and so we decided that uh, for the follow-up, we would do this um, uh, with using my MO, which is pre-recording it, no fans, not live and no comments. So it just stands on its own. Uh, so that's what we're doing. And um, the, the format that we've kind of agreed on here is that I'm gonna, uh, it's my turn to interview Tom. So I'm, I'm gonna, Tom, I'll ask you some questions and then we'll, we'll reverse it. You can ask me some questions and then I'll ask some follow-up questions. We'll see, uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, I will, uh, again, just sort of uh, preface everything by saying that I, I really don't consider myself an apologist. Um, there, are, there are people out there, I think, doing a good job at Christian apologetics and uh, within the Catholic world. Uh, I've got some good friends who are doing Catholic apologetics. That's not really my thing, um, but I do like a good conversation. And, um, you know, Tom, since you initiated this whole thing and got ball rolling uh, and I agreed to do it, we thought, well, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's keep it going. Let's keep the conversation going. So now when we talked the last time, I didn't really get a chance to get to know you very well. You were asking me questions and I was answering them. So I just thought we'd sort of start with, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, um, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Where do you live now? Anything, you know, you're comfortable sharing as far as that goes. All right. Uh, I was born in Dallas, Texas. I moved here and I was like sometime between four and eight. Grew up here, went to Catholic grade school, Catholic high school. I had major depression my entire life. Um, started working on being social and trying to meet people by inviting professors out to coffee, talk about philosophy. And that's how I started my YouTube channel and been forcing myself to go out and try and do as much social stuff ever since. Okay. So you said grew up here, but I missed where here is. Where do you live now? Um, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Oh, okay. Minneapolis. Yeah. I've actually spent uh, some time there. I went to college at the U of M in Minneapolis uh, myself. So, um, you know, uh, I kind of know the, the Twin Cities a little bit. Um, spent probably off and on at least eight or 10 years living in Minnesota. Um, it's pretty cold there in the winter, but, uh, but I guess that's one of the reasons why I, I came to Florida. So, so you grew up um, in the Catholic Church. That I, that was another question I was going to ask you because I remember you saying that you uh, you did have a church background and it was Catholic. So um, your parents uh, they brought you up in the church. Are they are they still around? Are they still Catholic? What's uh, what's going on there? I don't. I think I don't think they were ever Catholic. I just went to Catholic schools. Um, oh. But yes, they've always been very religious and they're still around. Don't really talk to them ever, though. I haven't ever really talked to them, even in my childhood. So, okay. So you guys didn't necessarily go to church on Sundays together as a family or anything. They just sent you to Catholic school. Uh we used to. I think a long time ago. Don't yeah. really remember much from back then. All right. Okay. I see you got guitars in the background. Uh, are you a musician? I tried learning for a while. I just. Uh, practice like the hardest songs I could find. So um, what's it? I forget what was it? Eric something. Uh, Steve Vai's Eugene's Bag of Tricks was the first song I learned. The second song I learned was one of the top 10 hardest intros or something. And those were, that's about the only two songs I really learned. And then a bunch of the smaller stuff like uh, Star Spangled Banner, Fur Elise, Dakota and Fugue. So I never really got into learning music theory or anything. It was just, mm, okay the complicated stuff that entertained me. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. I kind of went the opposite way. I, I actually did go to college and studied music theory and composition. 
Um, and I've, I've written a lot of songs, but the mistake I made, in case anybody's listening who wants to get into music, the big mistake I made was uh, I jumped too quickly into writing my own music without first learning, you know, the songs by the really good songwriters or really accomplished guitarists. And so, um, you know, I kind of skipped over the discipline and went right to the fun part and, uh, you know, consequently never got really good at it. So, so needless to say, uh, music is not my day job, even though at one time I hoped it would be right. So, um, that's how that went. What about you? The, what, what do you do for, uh, what pays the bills for you? YouTube. I'm, I'm full-time YouTuber. Really? So, wow. Well, good for you. I mean, that's impressive. That pays the mortgage. Yep. All right. Well, uh, that's encouraging to know that someone with 10,000 subscribers uh, can uh, make a full-time living on YouTube because I would have assumed that it would take more like, uh, you know, six figures or a million subscribers. Well, it's dependent on the, uh, like, number of people who donate. The donors are really the big factor, not really ad revenue. Ad revenue is a smaller portion of your income. So as long as you get big donors early, then yeah, it doesn't really matter what the number of subscribers you have. All right. So, um, so is that something you see doing long-term? Like, it, it, you know, for me, I'm a little bit older than you. If you don't mind me asking, like, how old are you? 33. You're 33. Okay. So you're the age of my son. I have a, I have a son who's 33, another one who's 30. Um, yeah, of course my generation, we, you know, it, it would never occur to us to, to do YouTube as a career, right? But is that something you see long-term or do you aspire to do something else at some point? Where do you want to go? Uh, well, I've been doing it for full time for five years now. Um, and it's growing every year. So I don't see any reason not to, but yeah. I really don't have much planned. I mean, I'd like to start an atheist church. That would be my goal. I'd like to build an apartment building and offer affordable rent and build a community like a commune kind of a thing where we can offer affordable places to live and help people to do all the things that the government does really crappily. I'd like to start a private company that um, appeals the government to send us tax information. So like if you sign up to my tax company, we'll just have the government send us the bill because they do all your taxes for you. You don't actually have to do anything. And in other, every other developed country, they send you a bill and if it looks right, you pay the bill and you're done. And that's all you have to do for taxes. But the government has a lot of red tape on what is allowed to do that because of TurboTax and all of the big companies that have lobbyists to make sure you have to spend money to give them for no reason. And I'd like to just start a private company that bypasses all that garbage and says, please send us the bill and we'll send it to our the people who signed up and then they can pay the bill and not have to do anything. And I think starting those kinds of private companies to bypass all of the legal red tape would be my goal to make life easier for people to decrease the cost of living for as many people as much as possible. That is the uh, modus operandi, the principle that we live by our, our doctrines. No, I like that. I mean, I, you know, I, I completely agree that, uh, you know, the whole tax system is broken. The IRS is ridiculous and unnecessary. Um, <laughs> I feel the opposite. I think the IRS is extremely necessary, but it's, they're auditing the wrong people. Um, I think the well, IRS should be yeah, funded but I more. Mean, if we had a flat tax, you wouldn't need most of the system. Right. I mean, to your point, you know, give me a flat tax, take it out of my paycheck. Then you don't even have to send me a bill and I don't even have to look at it. It's just take it out of my paycheck. We're done, you know, but, um, but I like, I mean, as much as the idea of an atheist church sounds like an oxymoron to me, I like how you recognize that the government uh, cannot do things well and the church can do things better. Now, for me, of course, I would, I would. Um, so much there. I'm just like, mm, well, almost. I, yeah, almost. no, no. I mean, I, I, I kind of get what you're saying, but, but hear me out and then you can respond to it if you want. But it's just like, um, you know, historically, the church, the Catholic church, the Christian church has always done a better job of taking care of people um, than governments. Yeah, no. I mean. No. Not the, even close. Yeah. I mean, look, you're talking to the historian. The Catholic Church invented hospitals, hospice, um, you know, all of that stuff. So 
yeah, I mean, the church has always done a good job of that. Right now, it's, you know, very much stifled, but um, get the government out of the way. And I mean, I think there's something we can agree on there. Um, mm, I doubt it. So, well, first thing is uh, flat taxes are, are not the greatest idea. I think that in order to mitigate uh, poverty, we should tax the poor less and tax the rich more. Have the flat tax be like for rich people and then decrease the taxes for the poor people. Well, that's fine. Be... I mean, honestly, to me, I, we could argue this all day, but I mean, to me, a flat tax means everybody pays the same percentage. So the rich people are automatically paying more because they're paying the same percentage of a larger amount. But if you want to put a threshold on there where, okay, if you make below this, you pay nothing. I'm fine with that. I, you know. But anyway, I mean, you know, it, it is it is what it is. And I I, I like your vision for a, um, you know, for, for the, the things you describe for making life better for people. Um, and I know you're not going to want to hear this, but it, it is a very Christian vision. It is, it is very much consistent with, you know, the vision of the church when it's been at its best. Um, well, I wish more churches would adopt that because the reason I would like to make this atheist church is because churches have a lot of opportunities in the legal loopholes they are given opportunities to access. And if the more of them did adopt this kind of policy that I'm trying to implement, then the world would be a much better place. So I think that the weakness of churches is that they're not doing the things that I think are very easy for them to do. Yeah. Um, and that's, I, I disagree where you said churches have always been better than the government at taking care of people. Like, to me, when I look at history, the greatest impact of healthcare, uh, longevity, longevity of life, um, decreases of disease um, has always been from healthcare su supplemented by the government. Um, and that's always well, outdone churches by such a huge margin. It's not even close. There's, there's no competition. Churches I, just no, don't I even matter. Wrong. I think historically, if you look at the whole grand scope of history, right? I hear what you're saying, though. I mean, you know, I I in terms of like, research and development for modern medicine, you know, you've got governments and you've got big corporations. Um, but, uh, but the church has always been there with, uh, you know, the actual care for people. Um, but this brings up a good, a, a good question that I was thinking about. Now I, I was going to ask. Oh, like, before, before you go on, I just want to yeah. mention the church benefits thing. I think there is a really important aspect that churches do well far better than anything in the government or the atheist community does, and that's build communities. The one thing I'm really jealous of yeah, that churches provide is a sense of community and opportunities to meet people, youth groups, friend groups, family groups, people who need help, like, oh, I, my car broke down, and you ask the congregation, anybody have a spare car I can use? Or I lost my home, can I stay at, your, at somebody's place for a while? I think churches do that extremely well. And I want to build something that has that aspect of churches for the atheist community. And so that's one area that I think churches definitely do extremely well at that other communities don't do. Yeah. I mean, some churches are better at that than others, but I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. So when you were growing up in the church and you were going to Catholic school and stuff, were you like, was your perception of the church that it was somehow opposed to science and scientific progress or that uh, it just sort of occupied a different space than science? Or, I mean, was, was your perception of, of, of religion and science adversarial or not necessarily? Or what, what, are you, what, are you, what do you... I didn't think about any of that back then. Back when I was going to church, I had like suicidal major depression. I didn't have any time to think about anything else. Mm. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. I mean, I you, you you mentioned something like that, something about that in in our last conversation. And of course, you know, I'm I don't want to pry or anything, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know. What's all right? Like it's all my whole story is on my YouTube channel in multiple videos. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So um, let's take this tack then. So um, at some point, you had you know you'd grown up going to Catholic school and everything. So I mean. Did you, did, did you at this point um, during this time sort of believe in God maybe by default or did you, you know, in the back of your mind, you were just not believing, but going through the motions or, or where were you at during this time? Yeah, I was a devout believer. My hope in God was the most important thing to me that kept me going. Like every morning, every night I would pray to God, ask for help to cure for my depression. And it was the fact that he did nothing for almost two decades. That's why I completely stopped being able to believe. So, so at some point you got to the point where you, um, 
made a decision, I guess, uh, to stop believing in God. Um, now you, you bill yourself as an atheist, you call yourself an atheist. And I'm wondering, um, why atheist specifically and not agnostic, for example, like, uh, for, for example, I wrote this book, um, uh, called from, uh, from star Wars to Superman Christ figures in science fiction and superhero films. So I wrote this book. And as part of the book, I interviewed uh, Ron Moore, who was the showrunner for like Babylon, uh, not Babylon 5, uh, the, uh, the, the reboot of um, Battlestar Galactica. And he was one of the, one of the writing team, one of the staff writers on uh, like Star Trek The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine. So he's, he's really sort of a major um, player in the science fiction world. And uh, so I got to interview him and the interview is in the book. And, you know, at one point we were talking about this issue and, and he also grew up in the Catholic church and he's what we call like a fallen away Catholic or whatever. And, and, um, and, and he made this comment, which I thought was very, uh, very insightful. He said he used to call himself an atheist, but now he calls himself an agnostic because he decided that is more intellectually honest to say, you know, I can't, I, I don't believe that there is a God or I can't prove that there is a God, but I also can't prove that there isn't one. So therefore I choose to call myself agnostic rather than atheist. And I'm just wondering like for you, where, where do you see the difference and why do you choose to call yourself an atheist as opposed to an agnostic, for example? Uh, sure. So the first thing was like, it was never a decision. I never made a decision to stop believing in God. It was just like, if you pray to a milk carton every day for like a decade and nothing happens, eventually you just stop believing the milk carton is conscious. And the same thing happened to me. It was more just over time having no effect on my life. I just stopped being able to believe it. There was no real decision. It wasn't, didn't happen like overnight. It was just uh, periodic. So like I'd stop stop praying as often and then less often, less often, less often until I just completely stopped. So there was no real decision for me. It was just um, um, lack of it having any impact or any effect on anything. Uh, why do I consider myself an atheist? Well, for the same reason I think Santa Claus doesn't exist. It's not like I'm agnostic to Santa Claus. It's like we have good reason to believe Santa Claus is something humans made up in their imagination. And likewise, we have good reason to believe that God concepts are something humans made up in their imagination, specifically type one and type two errors. So like, uh, tens of millions of years ago, back when we were just an evolutionary stage of life, if you hear a rustle in the bushes and you think it's a evil lion or whatever, and you run away, uh, you'd survive. But if you're like, I'm going to be scientific and think about this and uh, use the null hypothesis and wait for greater evidence, and there's a lion in the bushes, well, you get eaten. And so evolution prioritized the people who always thought it was a lion, even in the cases when it was the wind, because you had a higher survivability bias. Therefore, we have this hyperactive agency detection system. And so we see agency in all things um, all the time, even though it's completely irrational. So like, why do kids think there's a monster under the bed? Why do you get afraid of the dark when you watch a scary movie? Uh, why do you see, I forget what it's called, it starts with a P. It's very similar to your last name, actually, but there's like the syndrome where you see faces and things that there's no faces or see rabbits in the clouds. Humans see agency in things inherently because our brains are designed to do that. Um, and so I think it's rational to conclude that God concepts are exactly like Santa Claus, something that humans have made up. Therefore, I'm an atheist for the same reason I'm an a Santaist. I think Santa doesn't exist. Not that I'm just... Well, I mean, to Santa. be fair, there there is a historical basis for Santa Claus. I mean, there was a historical Nicholas of Myra a bishop who became Saint Nicholas and then with the addition of pious legend becomes Santa Claus. So uh, well, same with Jesus. So we also have historical basis for Jesus, but then when you get to the miracles parts, that's where it's like, that's probably fake. So I totally agree. There was a Saint Nick, just like I think there was a Jesus, but when you start going to the miracles and magic thing, that's where it's like, mm, probably human imagination. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's where you and I disagree because that's where I say that, you know, the, the logical flaw is in assuming that a lack of experience means a lack of existence. You know, like I haven't experienced a miracle in my life, therefore they, they can't possibly exist. I mean, the, well, because- I, I, Absolutely, that's right. So I just want to yeah, talk about I mean, that a little bit. That's an argument from ignorance. It hasn't happened, therefore it's false. But I would say that there's, again, there's good reasons to think it's 
product of human imagination, not simply that we haven't experienced. That's not like a good reason to think it's human imagination. It's all of the reasons in human justification that explain all of the phenomenon that religious people use to try to explain their belief in the God can be explained with natural explanations far, far better. And we have lots of natural explanations that would explain why they believe and everything that they think happened. And there's no reason to actually prioritize a God explanation for any of that. And so- Unless you're one of the people who's actually experienced it, then, then all bets are off. I mean, so what do you mean? just always remember this. When the bushes rustle, sometimes there really is a lion, yeah. right? So, you know, again, the, you know, this, this sort of, you know, evolutionary priority, if such a thing exists, and I'm not convinced it does, but this evolutionary priority for, um, you know, believing something is there when it's not, doesn't negate the fact that sometimes something is really there. So, but anyway, I mean, okay, so, so, th so that's, a, that's an interesting uh, point you're making because when you were interviewing me, you know, you were asking me questions like, okay, you know, like, how do you, how do you know your decision to be a believer is, uh, is the right decision? And, you know, for me, uh, although I, you know, I have had times in my life where I have made a conscious decision to continue my belief. Um, I never had to make a conscious decision to believe. I, I always believed. I grew up believing. And so I never was like converted from unbelief to belief. And, um, and so for you, it's a little bit different because you were, even though maybe you can't point to a moment of decision, you were over time converted from belief to unbelief. Um, and I, I understand your answer to, to sort of how you got that, how you got there, which is to say, you know, um, you, you perceived a lack of answer, a lack of answers to your prayers. So you prayed and you perceived that the prayers weren't answered. I just well, wonder- To me, it's, it wouldn't matter if they were answered. It had no effect. So even if their answer was no, it's synonymously the same. It wouldn't make a difference. Still no God. So Right. But I mean, yeah. And I, and I mean, I'm sure you've heard the argument as well as, you know, sometimes God's, God answers prayer and the answer is no. But the, but the other thing to consider is sometimes when God answers prayer, the answer is wait. And sometimes we wait a very, very long time. But it wouldn't make a difference. So if there's no God, if there was an all loving God, he would have helped. So it's essentially a proof there is no all loving God. Yeah. But so, well, you know what? I'll, I'll, I want to revisit that point. Uh, what well, we, I want to make up on one thing you said a little bit before. Yeah. You said people who experience God are more justified. And I'd say that's false. I don't think so. I feel like people who experience leprechauns. I just, said, I just said, when you say that there are better ways to explain the experience of God, of miracles, and, and et cetera, uh, apart from the existence of God, only, the only people who would say that are the people who have not experienced God in miracles, et cetera, right? Um, no, that's most atheists have those experiences too. Um, and so they still leave because they realize all of those, those experiences are better explained by natural phenomenon. So experience, personal experience of a deity is extremely common in humanity. Um, and that's better explained by naturalism than they're actually being a deity. Just like if someone has a personal experience of a leprechaun, that's better explained by a psychological phenomenon, which there's actually a literal um, cognitive disorder that people literally see leprechauns. We have a name yeah, for that. I know, I I know about... you mentioned that before, but I'm just saying, you know, for the believer, right? Um, I, you know, we, we would disagree with what you're saying. I mean, you know, obviously, sure. because, because, because our experience of God um, is not explainable in purely naturalistic terms. But anyway, uh, let, let's... Wait, what? Like, I don't, what, what possible experience wouldn't be explainable in natural terms? Like, I don't understand that. Sentence. Exactly the kind of experiences that I cannot describe to you, let alone prove to you. They're very personal experiences. Well, so like... Any experience you have is going to be something that can be reproduced by zapping you in the brain in the correct location. So it must necessarily oh, be. Oh, you say. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't think that's true, but. Well, because like, for example, the most profound experiences of God are from schizophrenics. We know that because we study their brain chemistry and their. And how are you defining religious. profound? Because you're putting a value judgment on something here. You're saying the most profound experiences. Yep. According to whom? 
profound to each case. To what definition? So when you ask each individual the magnitude of their experience or the, the significance of their experience um, on every metric you could possibly measure it on, the schizophrenics like this was so much more profound. So on any standard that you were going to measure profound based on your personal experience, they're going to beat you out because their brain yeah, chemistry saying, is significantly better. I'm not saying I have a better standard for measuring what is profound. I'm saying the very... It, the, the, the very definition of what is profound cannot be measured because in order for me to measure profound one experience versus another, I would have to personally have both of those experiences and compare them. But I can't have the experiences of schizophrenic and the schizophrenic can't have my experiences. So you can't compare them. So this yes, whole yeah. idea of comparing this is more profound than that, I, I reject it entirely. It's, it's impossible. Well, like, so you can measure how much it impacted their life, how much it changed their personality type, how much they were willing to do things in accordance with this belief. So if like, if you have a vision of a God who tells you to go dig a ditch, that's a thousand meters deep or something. Um, if it's a significant enough experience to cause you to do that, then you're going to say it's probably more profound than if you thought you had a dream and then like, well, then it probably no, wasn't very profound. No, because, for you. because a person who's mentally ill uh, will act on things that a person who's not mentally ill will not act on. And so you, you can't measure it by how much you act on something. It's, it, it's, the, these are all false measurements because, because you, you well, they're know. accepted in psychology and neurology. So like, these are not in some, yeah, can, okay, some psychological conditions, why, well, so, why, you're right in some conditions, but for others, no, like, Schizophrenics have a perfectly rational, intelligent mind. It's just under certain conditions, they have seizures and their brain fires off. And so in those certain cases, they're not experiencing the same level of rationality, but those are temporary. And then once they're gone, they start to be able to operate on a relatively normal basis again. And so as a rational I, human being- I'm not that kind of doctor, but the point is, is that they can't compare their experiences to mine and nor can I. And, and certainly- Well, Christians do this all the time. When you say like- the apostles were willing to die for their experience. Therefore, they really believed it was true. That's a way to measure how profound the experience is. That's a way to say, yeah, they're not sure, worried. Yeah. Really I mean, I this. agree with that. And that, but, but if you tell me, here's an, here's an apostle who was willing to die for his faith. And here's a, a person who was willing to, you know, dig a hole a thousand meters deep and 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 willing to die to do that you know those are not equal experiences you know so i mean it's just that's literally what they are so if, if no, you it, have it, an experience it, 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 the it, it, things it, you're doing whether you're digging a hole or living for jesus or willing to die for it are literally irrelevant the significance of the power of the experience is is it enough to cause you to change your life drastically in order to follow or do whatever this experience is guiding you to do. It doesn't matter if digging a hole is irrelevant. The significance of the action is irrelevant. What matters is, is if this experience is enough to change your life that you're willing to die for it, regardless of what it is, then that's a level of profound significantly higher than one that's just like, oh, I had a bad dream. Because you're not going to like change sure, your yeah, life I, for a bad dream. I do dream. understand that. I understand what you're saying. But, but uh, the, the specifics are not irrelevant. Right. And, and because and precisely at the point where psychology and and, you know, other cognitive sciences cannot measure them. So, you know, you're 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 doing that thing again where you're saying, well, here are these sciences and we're going to use science to put these parameters on religious faith and religious experience. And it's sort of like, you know, uh, trying to use. um I, I don't know what even, you know, I'm trying to think of a good analogy, but I mean, it's, it's just your, your uh, a ruler to measure weight or something. Is that what you're going for? Yeah. I mean, you're trying to apply physics to metaphysics and these are two different, these are two different realms. These are two different things that, you know, in large part do not answer each other's questions. Right. Um, so, so physics does n physics does not and cannot answer the questions of metaphysics. Well, right. um, well, that part I totally disagree with because I mean I'm a naturalist. So, metaphysics well, is just the fundamental yeah, but, nature of reality. So, if you're a physicalist naturalist, then literally metaphysics is just physics. But I understand the point you're trying to make. Yeah. But I'd say that all of the evidence we have to try to measure the 
profundity of an experience, whether it's measuring dopamine levels, measuring the impact on someone's life, how they're willing to change their life, all of the evidence that we can compile says certain actions are more profound than others. Now you can say hypothetically, there's some unmeasurable that we have no evidence for, but that no evidence can't be used to justify your position. So you can't say there might be something else we don't know, which may indicate that my personal experience is more profound than theirs. Like that's just an argument from ignorance. No, what I, All of the evidence we do have, the only things we can rationally base this on indicates that the schizophrenics have a much more profound religious experiences than anybody else. There's no other, no other data in any reference that shows that Christian experience is in any way more profound than theirs or any other religious experience. Right, All but I'm, the saying, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that the whole concept of measuring profundity is a flawed concept, right? Because if, if there's a drug addict who will do anything to get more drugs, on that scale of measurement, that's a very profound experience, right? Yeah. But to say that the actions that the drug addict will undertake to get more drugs uh, are no different in, in a certain sense from, you know, the, the, the way a person of religious faith lives their lives. I mean, that, you know, obviously that's not true. So I'm not the, following. So like, because the, the argument is, how do we measure the profundity of the experience? Yeah, I'm saying, I'm saying, stop measuring profundity. It's, it's pointless. It's not it's not a measurement of truth, right? Because, because, it's a, because it's a measurement of subjective experience. It's a supposed measurement of subjective experience, right? That, that does not measure comparative truth between one person's experience and another. Oh, right. I totally agree, but but you're the one who brought up the profundity. You, you were saying it's really profound. No, no you brought that up. You you were the one who said that you know that there's this way of measuring that you know s some non-religious experience is more profound than re so. I'm right, just right. but but the reason I brought that up was because measure. you said that religious people have this really profound experience, and so they're not going to agree that these things are explainable by natural processes or whatever. Right. Yeah. My response to that was. Neither are the, the epileptics. The epileptics also think their personal experience isn't going to be explainable by natural processes. So the profundity, I agree, has completely nothing to do with truth. Oh, no, so I mean, just, no. just, just one, one second. Just, just yeah. in the same reason we shouldn't use profundity to measure the truth of epileptics, we also shouldn't use profundity to measure the truth of religious experience because you're right, profundity is completely irrelevant. So saying that religious people have a really profound experience, therefore they wouldn't agree it's explained by naturalism, isn't evidence for either one. I totally agree. Yeah, well, then we agree on that. But the point is, is that, you know, science can explain the experience of an epileptic. It cannot explain the experience of, uh, you know, a miracle or, you know, a, uh, a some, some, a lot of religious experience, a at least not to, like the the satisfaction, not to the satisfaction of billions of people around the world. So, well, I'm sure the epileptics aren't satisfied with the natural explanation either, but again, that's irrelevant. Whether they're satisfied doesn't matter. There's an objective way we can say which explanation is better, which one makes novel predictions, which one can make it expected data more relevant, which one has the most explanatory power on all measurable data. The naturalism hypothesis explains religious experience and the miracles doesn't at all. It's not even considered legit in any of the academic fields, well, neurology, psychology, yeah, cognitive science. Again, that's because, you know, this is, it's, it's not, you know, this is metaphysics, not physics. But I guarantee you, if you say to the epileptic, I can give you a pill that will, that will prevent you from having these experiences in the future, the epileptic is going to say, yeah, give me that pill. And if you, if you sell it, tell a Christian, I can give you a pill that'll prevent you from having, you know, your religious experiences, the Christian's going to say, get away from me. So well, they both say both. So there's both of there are both examples of epileptics who don't want the pill and Christians I, who do want the pill. I know, but you know what? But, I'm saying. You know, it, well, no, it's, it's it's a false analogy because that doesn't actually explain anything. There are epileptics who like their experiences, and there are Christians who have lots of powerful experiences that they don't like. So it just the analogy didn't add up anything. Yeah, but no, I I, th I think what I think what we're getting stuck on is I don't have a need to explain anything, right? So you so you know. When, when, when I talk about religious experience and when I talk about the experience of God throughout a person's life um, that leads a person to have religious faith, um, we're not really looking for explanations for those experiences. Um, and, and this is where I think we keep getting stuck on this idea that, you know, um, 
there is a difference between physics and metaphysics and you know physics was never meant to answer the questions of metaphysics i mean you know for that i, I mean on that point metaphysics doesn't always answer the questions of physics either you know uh genesis is not a science textbook genesis is not attempting to explain to people you know the processes by which god created the universe genesis is um an affirmation that there is a god who is a creator who did create the universe but don't you know don't look for genesis to be a, a science textbook so anyway um i wanted to i wanted to be fair with our time so you know we've been kind of um dealing with with uh the questions that i started with if you want to take some time and if you've got some questions you want to ask me we can do that for a little while so i don't know if you had anything prepared sure what do you mean by physics doesn't answer metaphysics that's like literally metaphysical naturalism literally does that so metaphysics yes, is just, I, I hear you saying that you believe that but i would i would argue that that's incorrect it, it sounds to me like you're saying there's really no such thing as metaphysics. It's all physics. Well, metaphysics just means the fundamental nature of reality. That's all it means. No, metaphysics means beyond physics. So in other words, the, no. the, that which is metaphysical is that which is beyond the reach of, of you know, physics and, and the physical. No, really metaphysics bad. is the branch of oh, philosophy yeah. that deals with the first principles of things. It doesn't, there's no beyond physics. Yes, in well, you're, you're using a particular definition of metaphysics. I'm saying this is what I'm talking about. The, you know, there are questions, and yeah, so there are philosophical questions that the science of physics cannot answer. So I'm not you, following exactly. So like... Metaphysics in philosophy is specifically the branch of philosophy that deals with the first principles of things, fundamental nature of reality. That's what it means. So if you're a metaphysical naturalist, then physics would answer those questions. Yeah. So, and I'm saying I am not one of those. Right. And, I, I grant, but, so, yeah, but, I mean, but you, when but, you use the word metaphysics, are you talking about something different? Because if you're specifically saying the things beyond physics, then you're using the, the word to mean something different than what it's used academically, which is fine. But, uh, I mean, I don't, you know, like I said, I don't claim to be a philosopher, but I am using the word metaphysics in the sense of those things which are beyond physics, those things which are beyond the reach of, um, let's say, academic study according to the, to the, to the bodily senses. Um, and so to the extent that philosophy deals with those questions, Yes, but if you're if you're reducing the concept of metaphysics to you know so-called you know first principles, and you're saying that all of that can be explained uh, through naturalism, I would disagree with that. Well, I'm sure you would disagree, but yeah, if you're saying that physics can't answer metaphysics, essentially you're just that'd be like me saying God can't answer anything. It's like it's just an assertion. There's no evidence of that. It's, it's your opinion, which is fine. No, I mean, but, it's not an opinion. It's because I'm defining metaphysics as that which is outside of the reach of the sciences of physics. Right. So you're using the definition that's very different from the academic definition. That's where I was getting lost because clearly well, like if... As far as I understand it, that's the definition I learned. So uh, I don't know what, you know, contemporary philosophers are doing with it nowadays, but I mean, there are philosophical questions that cannot be answered by science. Well, again, that's begging the question. So metaphysics in the Greeks, when they use the term metaphysics, just literally the etymology, meta means beyond physics is beyond physics. But for like the past 700 years, metaphysics has been understood as like best understood through physics. So the, the word has evolved just like the word universe has evolved. Universe used to mean all things. Now it's just a subset of things. Atom used to mean the smallest possible thing. All right, now well, we know that atoms are made of other things. So the academic progress in the field over the past 700 years, it has not been used in that way. Well, I guess I'm a little behind the time, seeing as how everything in the last 700 years is current events for me. But here's the point. I believe that there are philosophical and theological questions that cannot be answered by the natural sciences. It sounds like you're saying you do not believe that, right? You're, you're saying everything can be answered 
by the natural sciences. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a naturalist, so I think right. everything is- And I'm saying, natural. no, there are things that cannot be answered by the natural sciences. And these are the things of, these are the things of what I would call metaphysics, but uh, these are certain philosophical um, questions about the, you know, the nature of existence and about the existence of God and who God is and, uh, and all of these things. And, and see, the, the problem, I think, is that when you define or, or when you say that everything can be, can be explained through the natural sciences, then you're stuck then saying anything that can't be explained through the natural sciences therefore must not exist. And I'm saying, no, there are things that exist that cannot be explained through the natural sciences. And, you know, God is one of those things, right? So you're kind of, you know, almost backing into an atheism via a sort of limited view of the universe that says, well, everything's got to be explainable through natural means. And if it's not, it doesn't exist. Well, no. So I'm saying that there's only reason to believe all things are natural. Simply saying, here's something we don't know, um, and I'm going to assume it can't be explained by naturalism, is begging the question, an argument from ignorance. So if we, if anything, there's we don't know about the universe, philosophical questions, origin of the universe, anything you want to pick, um, all of the evidence indicates naturalism is more likely to explain that in the future than any other thing we have. There's no other thing that has any evidence that may potentially be able to explain that. So inductively, it's like if we say. Um, what works, um, chemistry or astrology? We're trying to figure out a problem, say, what is pi to the 10 millionth digit? You're more likely to figure that out using chemistry than astrology, even if chemistry may never be able to answer that question, because we know chemistry at least works at some things and astrology works at no things. So if there's something that has no examples of it ever working, um, using it to solve an unknown, even if the unknown is like a different kind of question that we have no idea how to solve yet, it's more plausible to use a tool we know works at something than a tool that has no evidence it works at all. Yeah. Well, again, you know, where, where that breaks down is, you know, in the realm of personal experience where, you know, um, if you, you know, if a person says, well, we, we don't know whether palm trees exist. So, you know, what, what works, what's going to work best to discover whether palm trees exist. And, and then you come to the conclusion that, you know, palm trees don't exist. But you're talking to a guy who, you know, grew up in Jamaica, you, you know, you're, you're bumping up against um, what people know to be true by, by their personal experience and by, uh, by the witness of, of the people who came before them, which is, you know, what we ended up with in our last conversation. Well, I mean, I, I, if there was some evidence that God existed, um, like if you could meet him and have him give you gold bricks or whatever, then yeah, that would that'd be totally true. So like say God is living in Australia and you, you know God personally. He's like, God, you created the universe? Okay, show me, make me a gold brick. And he makes you like 10 gold bricks and you can show it. That's great. And then you travel to America and there's like, there's no evidence of his God. And you're like, yeah, there is. I've met him. I, he's done these novel Tesla predictions over there. That would be great, per perfectly fine to, to at that point be like, well, I'm rejecting the claim of the atheist that there's no evidence. But simply saying you have a personal experience which hasn't produced any novel testable predictions and hasn't been verified in any way is literally no different than the person who has an experience of a leprechaun. And so there would need to be some extra biblical evidence here that this thing exists independent of our imagination, because if you don't have that, then it's exactly the same as every other psychological condition we know about. And that's really the claim the atheist is making. It's like, yeah, I know you've claimed to have these personal experiences, but do you have more than the guy who believes in leprechauns? And that's where the breakdown of the conversation is because we've never been presented that. What, what, yeah. is, what is more than the guy who believes in the leprechauns? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, that's fair because if you're if you if you're faced with the with the Christian believer and and the guy who you know believes in leprechauns and you're asking the question which one of you should I believe, then it you know then it becomes a question of how much do you trust each one of these guys? What's the background behind each one of these guys? How you know how many people have believed in each one of these two systems, leprechauns versus Christianity throughout the centuries. And, you know, what's the legacy and who are the martyrs who, who died for their witness? And, you know, how was it passed down from one generation to the next? It becomes, 
it, it, it comes down to questions like that. And then it, and so, then well, just to, I want to pick up on that really quick. Like yeah. all of the things you listed are just completely irrelevant. Like none of that is evidence of any kind. Like I wouldn't care how many people believed in leprechauns or how many problem. people believed that yeah. you don't care about that. That is exactly your problem. That you just to clarify, it's, it's more than I don't care. care about that. It's, it's more than I don't care. It's that these methods scientifically have proven are all unreliable. None of them work. They don't count as evidence for anything. Magicals, miracles, mythical creatures, paranormal, supernatural, UFOs, completely zero evidence. The historical context doesn't matter. The number of people don't matter. The martyrs don't matter. The where how much you trust this guy doesn't matter. Like I wouldn't, if I, if Newton, I, Isaac Newton came to me and said, alchemy, I believe I can turn iron into gold. I'm like, demonstrate it. I don't care. I don't trust you. I'm not going to believe you because I think you're smart. I need actual evidence, not your beliefs. Does I don't care how many other alchemists believe it. I don't care how many martyrs are going to die for. I don't care what the historical context is. I need evidence. And none of those things are evidence. So all of the things you listed don't give any, any reason to believe you're more rational than the leprechaun believer. Right. But I mean, you know, it, my, my point is not to say you should have faith in me. Um, but it, but it does require faith. I mean, if I could say to God, geez, God, you know, Tom's got 10,000 followers. If you could really manifest yourself and prove yourself to him, drop some gold bricks on his desk, he would become a believer. And then he could witness to all these 10,000 people. And I, you know, I could go to God and say that, and God's going to say, mm, no, not going to do that. You know, um, because God isn't manipulated and also because at the end of the day, faith is faith. It's not based on proof. Um, it requires faith. And so, you know, that's, that's, that is the place where it, it's always going to break out, break down, no matter who you talk to. I mean, you know, you, you could talk to the best apologist in the world. And I, I see that you have talked with some really good ones. Um, but at the end of the day, you're looking for the kind of proof that very often God simply refuses to give. Well, that, that's fair. But to me, that just sounds like you're admitting the atheist is right because our claim. Is well, I'm right. not admitting the atheist is right, but what I'm admitting is that I will never be able to prove it to you. And I certainly didn't come on tonight, you know, thinking I was going to convert you. I mean, you know, if, if your argument is that God, that the existence of God can't be proven, then yes, you are right. If your argument is God doesn't exist, then no, you're not right. Well, again, so my argument is, is that you have equivalent evidence to the guy who believes in leprechauns. That's the atheist claim. I have equally as much reason to be an a leprechaunist as I do an a goddess. Yeah. Atheist. Well, well, well right. just to and clarify. So, that. so when you, when you say that uh, it takes faith and that if you were going to go to God and say, give him a gold brick, he's just not going to do that. Well, the leprechauns could say exactly those words. Like, well, I could go to the leprechaun and ask him to give you a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but he's just yeah. not going to do it because right. the leprechaun doesn't like being manipulated. And so right. from an atheist perspective, your claims look exactly identical. You make the exact uh, same claims. You make the exact same that. evidence. I so, hear that. But at least, to, at least in my defense, I've never claimed that I was going to be able to give you convincing evidence, right? That's never been, that's never been my claim. Um, all, right. all, um, all I can do is, is be one of many witnesses, one of many witnesses to it. And, and the problem is that if you, you know, or any atheist sort of takes this, this approach that, well, you know, the witnesses don't matter, the history doesn't matter, the, you know, the, um, the, you know, the way that the, the teaching's been handed down over time doesn't matter. If all those things don't matter, then we really have nothing to talk about because that's what it's all about, right? Oh, I agree. This, this is the part that I find really interesting because yeah. from a scientific perspective, we've analyzed all of those lines of evidence, not just for Christianity, but for literally every belief. And we found they don't work. Like they don't work, uh, what's his name? The younger, younger and elder, Plinius the Younger, Plinius the Elder, they Plin wrote about the history of Rome. And they said, Rome was founded by Romulus and Remus, who was raised by a wolf, and no historian takes that seriously. These guys were well-acquainted historians. They're some of the best historians of the time. We take all of their work very seriously. We try to analyze it and historically find the battles they, they found, they like documented in archaeology. They are some of the most trusted historians in the world. But when they make miracle claims, we're like, nope, that's dumb. And this is the same for every single historian throughout all human history. The same standard for everybody. 
But for some reason, Christians say, well, in Christianity, it's different. We'll yeah. take this guy well, a little more seriously. Here's why we say it. Here's why we say it. Because our own personal experience is such that when we read it, we go, yeah, you know what? That rings true to me because I have experienced things like that. Or I have experienced the Holy Spirit in my life. Or I have experienced things that corroborate those things, at least to a certain degree, at least enough that I've decided, and many like me, yeah, I'm going to devote my life to this. So, yeah, no, I completely hear what you're saying. Uh, and yet, and yet, explain me, you know, explain the billions like me, you know, are we all deluded? You probably think so. Um, but I don't, know if I, I don't know if I'd call it a delusion because delusion has like a specific medical yeah. term, but I'd say that if somebody had an experience of Romulus and Remus, um, I wouldn't say they're rational to now believe Plinius the Elder wrote about Romulus and Remus and that's right because they had a personal experience of Romulus and Remus. It doesn't matter how many people believe it, it doesn't matter how many experiences they have of this, until you can show this is more just imag than imaginary, I wouldn't think it's rational to believe that the historical context of that mirrors your personal experience is rational. And we know that people do this. Like we know that, I remember Oliver Sacks, V.S. Ramachandran, and some other really big neurologists and psychologists have talked about visions children have of a large rotund man in a red cape with a large white beard coming down the chimney at night. And they have these profound experiences of this guy. Are they now rational to believe Santa Claus is real? No, because personal experience doesn't justify claims of things independent of your imagination you need more than that and so well, again you, you you're looking for evidence but to be fair to the ancient historians though you do have to separate um the traditions they're relating from before their time and the things that they witnessed right so in other words if you have a roman historian who says on one page Rome was founded by these two twins who were raised by a she-wolf. She and then on another page, he says, you know, there was this battle and I was there, right? One is he's just, he's just copying an older book. And then the other one, he's giving an eyewitness account. And so we do have to, we do take those differences into account within the Christian story too. But at any rate, I mean, I think. Well, just to I clarify. We understand are... each other. It's just that we, we've sort of come to an impasse as far as, um, you know, the, this idea of, of to what extent personal experience can corroborate, you know, the, the tradition, et cetera. Oh yeah. Just clarify. There are miracle claims. All of the ancient historians have miracle claims, both pre and during their lifetime. Yeah. So it's like, we don't take any of them seriously. It doesn't matter when. Well, but you know what? Maybe we should, maybe we should take some of them seriously. Right. Why? Maybe there are things, maybe there are things that happen in the universe that we can't explain. Well, yeah, sure. But the question is, is should we believe they did or should we, what's more, what is the more justified position to take? Say someone wrote historical documents that unicorns existed um, in the 1300s or something, which there are, there are other cases of that. Right. But you, but you, I think you're too quick to, to rule things out. Um, I think you're too quick to limit what is possible. Well, so like my position would be is, it's rational to say the unicorn does not exist until we find like actual remains of a unicorn. If we find fossils, unicorn fossils or something, then we can go back and be like, well, now that we have this empirical evidence that there were unicorns, we can go back and look at the historical like, account and say, well, maybe that was true. But until we actually have that empirical verification to show that it's not just a figment of their imagination, we have a large body of data that shows humans make stuff up all the time. It's very, very ubiquitous that humans make stuff up. And so if we're trying to say what caused this person to write about unicorns, what's the better explanation? And we have a large body of evidence of this psychological feature of humans that do this all the time and no evidence that unicorns actually existed. A more plausible explanation is it's probably the psychological thing, not that unicorns actually existed. Now, obviously it could be the case that there was a unicorn he actually saw, he actually wrote it down. But until there's some independent verifiable evidence to indicate that, the rational decision is never to say, yeah, unicorns probably existed. Well, look, I mean, you know, speaking as a historian, um, you know, you're, you're using the word evidence in a more limited way than I would. So you're saying, 
we have a document, and I know the unicorn is probably not a great example, but but go with it as a generalization. Let's assume you have a document that says somebody saw a unicorn, and you're saying, okay, I won't believe it until I have evidence like a unicorn skeleton is found somewhere. But I would say, well, wait a minute, the very existence of the document is one piece of evidence. Now, we may choose to, to dismiss it. We may choose to find other reasons why the person wrote that than he actually saw a unicorn. But it is still one piece of evidence. If, if you have a document from you know, the year 1000 and it says, you know, King so-and-so went out and saw a unicorn and tried to chase it down, but couldn't find it. Okay. You know, we all know that, you know, medieval stories have a lot of embellishment and that's probably what it is. But on the other hand, you know, the story itself is one piece of evidence, right? Which you may decide needs to be corroborated with other pieces of evidence, but it's still evidence. It's still something that may be based on, you know, something that actually happened. So, you know, we have to um, sort of understand that there's, there's different kinds of evidence there's um and, and and textual evidence is evidence um at any rate i mean we're you know i don't want to go in circles here did you uh did you have questions that you wanted to ask me specifically uh oh you said you were in minnesota did you have to tell any like contacts here or people like pastors apologists in the local area no not really i mean this was back in the um uh 80s uh i i went to um went to the university of minnesota uh minnesota yeah i see i even say minnesota like a minnesotan where i leave the ends out it's minnesota right <laughs> i still say it like that i went uh, i went to the university of minnesota um 81 to 85 and um so no i don't really have any uh i, I don't know anybody i don't think who's still in minnesota okay um question about the historians and miracle claims thing just to robert lacona's paper i like that um in there he quotes robert webb um describing the methodological limitary limitations of historians which i think is an accurate description of the consensus of historians about what history can and can't justify i uh, was so it's like what is usually understood to constitute history is not making an ontological statement about the totality of reality rather it is recognizing that the modern discipline of history focuses on a particular facet of that reality um and he goes on describing miracle claims so he's saying that you're not allowed to make this kind of ontological statement that miracles exist unicorns exist you're only allowed to reference things we already know that exist like if we discovered fossils of unicorns then we could say yes unicorns existed then we could infer that back in history but he's making the same limitation here that we need some kind of empirical evidence of the thing existing before it can even be considered as it actually being evidence of this thing occurring in the past as attested by their testimony. Um, and isn't that the consensus among historians right now? And why is that wrong? Well, I would, I, I would argue uh, that, that the existence of a story is one piece of evidence for the historicity of that story. Even if, you know, even if you should find a document that says, you know, space aliens came down and built the pyramids. Okay. That story is one piece of evidence in favor of the story. Now you may, like I said, decide based on other evidence to dismiss the story as non-historical. Um, but, but I think those historians who say, who sort of dismiss, you know, textual evidence as evidence out of hand, I think are, are making a mistake. And there are those. And so I haven't read the article you're um, referring to. So it may come from sort of that branch of history that, that is, um, you know, maybe more, more limited or more skeptical. But, uh, but I always argue that, you know, the, the existence of a story is one piece of evidence for the story. You may want more evidence before you believe it. And that's fair but the existence of the story is one piece of evidence in favor of the story. So, I mean, I, I think be, because there's, there's a way, for the most part, the, the survival of texts is not random or 
um, accidental for the most part. Obviously, it's possible for a text to accidentally survive. But for the most part, for ancient texts to survive to today, they would have had to have been copied, which means they would have had to have been um, believed to be important. Um, and so the, the, the very fact that a text still exists from the ancient world means something about how that text was perceived. Um, now, granted, when you read the content of a text and, and the author tells you about what the world is like, you may be reading, you may be learning more about the author than about the world. That's true. Um, but still that, you know, that the, the, the existence of a text is at least one piece of evidence. So I would maybe open it up a little bit more broad than, than what you're reading. But um, yeah. Well, yeah. Cause I, my, the immediate things that come to my mind is like, imagine we were like 3000 years in the future or whatever, and people were discovering fossilized books or whatever today, the vast majority of them are going to be Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings and nowhere in those books, except maybe the first page does it say this is a fiction. And so if they read them as if they were historical documents, would that be evidence that elves and dwarves and things existed, even though there's no fossil record of any of Well, those? I mean, I can't speak for the people 3,000 years from now, but it does, it makes me think of Galaxy Quest, where, you know, the, uh, the aliens have been watching, you know, Gilligan's Island and the reruns, and they think it's, they think it's real. Um, well, I mean, you know, the, 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 the problem with that argument is that, um, you know, those, those books are intentionally fictional and uh, they're- but the people in the future don't know that. What's that? The people in the future don't know that. They just, they just have the documents and there's lots of copies of these documents. So it was obviously very important to them in the past. Sure, Nowhere but the people in this... the future would also know what kind of a publishing industry exists right now, how much of that publishing industry is fantasy and fiction and what are the purposes of those genres of literature? Just like we know, we have a, a pretty good understanding about the different genres of literature in the ancient world. Not that they didn't write fiction, they did, but for the most part, you know, in the ancient world, a lot of times, you know, when they wrote fiction, I mean, it's- Embellished? Oh, sure, yeah, I mean, and I mean- so so just like, as you said, in the future, they'd know that we have a publishing industry that has lots of fiction books. Today, we know that the publishing back then was embellished and they made stuff up and they added things that weren't real and there's lots of miracles and magic and mythical creatures. So it seems like the same argument could be made for both then and now that we know that there are these massive flaws in the recording of the documents at the time period that make them pretty unreliable. And so we probably shouldn't take them at face value today comparing the 3,000 years ago and 3,000 years in the future comparing today, seems like you could make the analogous argument. Well, but again, you know, if, if, you're, if you're looking at Harry Potter 3,000 years from now, you're saying, all right, this is an intentionally fictional book. Um, if 3,000 years from now, uh, someone picks up a, uh, you know, a book that's not fiction, a nonfiction book, right? And they know the difference, then they're going to they're going to put more stock in the nonfiction book at, in terms of how much it describes the world we live in, and we do the same thing with the ancient world. I mean, we we know what a fictional account was, and we know that, for example, the gospels that are in our Bible were not written to be fictional accounts. They were written to be, you know, basically biographies of you know of Jesus and the apostles. I mean, not okay, not necessarily the way. Somebody might write a biography today, but you get the idea. I mean, they're, 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 they're meant to be nonfiction, you know. Well, again, the argument is suppose they don't know it's fiction and they pick up the Harry Potter in the future and no one knows it's fiction. Supposedly, it's a historical that, document. I mean, that's, that's not uh, an analogy for, what we, for, for how we read ancient texts. We know, mm -hmm. what, we, we know which texts were, you know, fictional and and which ones are, you know, not, I guess. You know. So, so that's irrelevant to the argument. The argument isn't about whether it doesn't matter if it's fiction. The point is that does the fact that it's in a lot of books written at some time period and we don't know if it's fiction or not or we think it's real or whatever, does that constitute evidence of magic and miracles and unicorns and everything? And I'd say no, just like well, I'm just saying historians. It, it, you might you might say, oh, there's a piece, you know, there's a piece of evidence, but we're, you know, we're 
it's superseded by these other pieces of evidence or, uh, or whatever. So um, it, it, the, the analogy doesn't really work for the publishing industry today. You know, I'm speaking as a historian with the ancient documents. Um, it's not really the same thing, you know? I mean, if somebody picks up, you know, the, if, you pick up a, if you pick up an ancient document, if you find an ancient document that has survived, right? This is a document that if it was copied, it had to be hand copied, right? I mean, you know, it's a whole different world where, you know, they print millions of copies of Harry Potter. Obviously, some of those are going to survive. So, I mean, it's, it's a whole different thing. I don't think it really makes sense as an analogy. Well, I don't understand what the disconnect there is. It's like, for me, it's pretty obvious. Yeah, it doesn't matter what we find. It doesn't matter what the books say. It doesn't, it's irrelevant. Because you can write down whatever words you want on a piece of paper. Um, the fact that words are written on a sheet of paper isn't evidence that the words correspond to reality. For that, you need something else. Um, so it doesn't matter if it's Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings or the Bible or whatever. It doesn't matter when it was written. None of that matters. It's it's is there any independent reasons to believe this is true and corresponds to reality? Just the fact that it's written down, I don't care. Like if well, you can I write down, you. I well, have a billion dollars in my bank account. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, although I, I do not share that approach to literature. Um, and I think that when you say that some outside evidence is required to corroborate what's in the text, you seem to be limiting that outside evidence to material culture, which is fine. I mean, that's important, uh, archaeology, et cetera. But, um, but there's such a thing as, you know, multiple texts corroborating each other. And at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the longevity of the ideas and the, you know, the, the tradition uh, of the way in which uh, the Christian teachings are handed down within the institution of the church as well. So, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot going on there. Um, I hear, I hear what you're saying, but I don't really share your, uh, your opinion that, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's the Bible or Harry Potter, it's all just words on a page. Um, I would disagree with that. And, you know, I mean, obviously I don't, it's not like I believe in miracles because there are old books that talk about miracles, right? I, I, you know, I believe in the existence of miracles. And so then when I read an old book that talks about miracles, I'm open to the possibility that that actually happened because I already believe in the existence of miracles. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So like, I think of it as somebody today has personal experience of Romulus or Remus and supposed we find that there are some documents that were written at the time when Rome was supposedly founded of accounts of people directly having personal experience of Romulus and Remus. And there are multiple corroborating documents from the time. I still feel like, yeah, none of that's reasonable to believe. I, I don't, I don't count that as evidence. It doesn't. Right. Matter. But but you're saying that based on, uh, in part, at least based on the content. So you're kind of, I think you're contradicting yourself because you're on one hand, you're saying it doesn't matter what the text says, but on the other hand, it seems to me you're saying, doesn't matter how much corroborating evidence there were, there would be, I'll never believe it because it's ridiculous. Right. And so, so there is a sense in which you are dismissing it partly based on the content itself. And I mean, I'm, you know, I'm with you. I, I don't personally believe the Romulus and Remus story as a historical fact either. Um, but I also don't believe that it doesn't matter what, what the content of the text is. I think it does matter. And um you know, well, I'd, I'd agree. So I think that this only applies to things that don't have an empirical basis. So, and this is the same standard used in history and law, things that are miracles, magic, mythical creatures, the paranormal, supernatural, UFOs, anything that has no empirical basis are things that are not reasonable to believe based off of testimony. Um, and so all the things rejected in history are the miracles, magic, mythical creatures, paranormal, supernatural, UFOs. There's also other stuff that we think are fictions yeah, or just sure. embellishments. But any of those things in that initial category are just offhand rejected initially, just like in the court case. Somebody says, an alien stole my cow, and the insurance company should pay for it. They're just going to throw out the court case. No, we don't. Sure, no but I mean, for aliens. But, the, but, you know, the problem is, is that for billions and billions of people throughout the course of history and billions of people today, we're not a courtroom. And the testimony of witnesses we trust does matter, right? 
And so we do believe things that you might think have no other imperial, empirical evidence to back them up, and we believe them anyway on the basis of the testimony of witnesses. But should we? Well, you know, that is, I guess, a fair question. But you and I are always going to uh, come up with a different answer to that question. You're going to say we, you're going to say we shouldn't believe them on principle, and I'm going to say there are some things that are worth believing that that you take on faith. What do you mean by on principle? Because I would say that the same reasons law and history and science don't trust personal experience are the same reasons we shouldn't trust personal experience. It's kind of like, well, um, you know, the, the Me Too movement, yeah, the listen and I believe? Mean by on principle. Yeah, that's what I mean by on principle. Like, so I'm saying, well, there might be things that law and science, you know, there, there might be things where there's not enough evidence for a courtroom or a laboratory, but I'm going to believe it anyway, and it's reasonable to do so. We'll take like the Me Too movement where you're supposed to believe any woman who said that they've been sexually assaulted. Like, that seems like a really important issue. Um, do you think it's rational to just believe anybody who says that or should we probably wait? You know, the law is probably the way to establish this and we shouldn't persecute someone unless they've been convicted. Like, to me, it seems like maybe we should wait for evidence that's actually been adjudicated by like people who are experts in this field and not just believe because it's an important issue. Well, sure, but that's, you know, that is, you know, like, we're not saying believe everything everybody says. We're saying there are certain witnesses whom we trust throughout history, and we believe them, right? Um, and, and we believe them in part because, uh, because what they're saying is based on, you know, these 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 principles of you know ten commandments and the law of love so you know nobody's it's it's not an accusation kind of thing you know what i mean so i so no i mean you know just because i don't believe everything everybody says doesn't mean i refuse to believe anything anyone says just because their experience can't be proven well sure but so mike my analogy is Believing someone was sexually assaulted is, there's lots of evidence of that happening in the world. We have lots and lots of evidence of that occurring. And so if someone says that, the probability that it occurred seems to be significantly higher than the probability a miracle occurred by somebody else saying it. So somebody else says Jesus rose from the dead or something. Which well, of I these two claims is more say, plausible? But, but that's not, it, it doesn't have to be a contest. It's not, you know, have there been, throughout, throughout history, have there been more sexual assaults or more miracles? I don't know. It's, that's not the point. My question is more like, if we had some standard of evidence that says anything above this line, we should believe anything below this line, we shouldn't believe kind of a thing. Um, the probability of somebody claiming they were sexually assaulted and it being true is significantly higher than the probability of somebody claiming they saw a miracle and it being true. But that line doesn't exist. I know I, I can tell how badly you want that line. You want a standard. You can say, well, if there's this much evidence, I'm going to believe it. And if there's this much, I won't. But, but, Religious faith, and especially Christianity, simply doesn't work that way. There is no line. There is no standard level of evidence at which you can say, aha, now that's enough evidence to believe. Because again, if there were, it wouldn't require faith. That wouldn't be faith. And it does require faith. That's just the way the whole thing is set up. The whole thing is set up is, you know, is, is God saying, I want people to believe in me by faith or not at all. And therefore, I will not be proving myself to the skeptics. You know, if, if someone wants to be a skeptic, that's their choice because they have free will. But I'm not jumping through hoops, right? You want to believe in me, you will do it by faith or not at all. And that's, you know, that's the bottom line. Well, to me, again, that just it sounds like you're saying the atheists are right, because, I mean, we do have that line for a lot of things. Like, we have that line for history, we have that line for law, we have that line for science. But, sure, but it seems but like you're saying that you just can't reach that line because you need faith, and so it's like, here's some evidence, and you supplement that with faith, then you get above the line. Um, but to me, that's like saying, well, we have some evidence of leprechauns, and if you supplement without faith, but then you get above the line. And well, so, sure. I mean, a person can have faith in leprechauns, right? I mean... 
that's that's obviously possible. Um, you know, but then it becomes a question of, you know, are you putting your faith in the right thing, or are you putting your faith in something that is trustworthy, something that is worthy of your faith? And you know, in the experience of Christians throughout history, you know, I mean, I'm confident that I'm putting my faith in in God who A, exists, and B, is actually trustworthy. Does God do everything I want all the time? Of course not, you know? Does God disappoint me sometimes? Yeah, if I'm too focused on what I want, or, you know, if I want God to do things my way. Have I been mad at God at points in my life? Yes, I have, right? Um, but at the end of the day, I, yeah, I, you know, I, I, keep believing because I, because I am confident that God is trustworthy. Well, so, so I, just, I still wanted to pick up on this, like to me, cause it seems like you're saying the atheists, right? Cause the atheists are saying, here's the line. You can't reach that line without faith. And you're like, you're right. You can't reach that line without faith. And so we're saying, well, then it's not reasonable to believe, but you're saying, well, we just have faith. And so here's, here's the actual evidence for Christianity well, say, here's the line where it's reasonable to believe. And it's under that line. So yeah, like, I mean, we're agreeing on that statement. I think it seems like we're agreeing that it's I, under that no, line. Well, okay. So let me, let me say, first of all, I'm not saying that there's this much evidence, but with faith, you're going to get above the line. I'm not saying that because forget the line. There is no line. You're never going to get above the line. Now, if you want me to say that believing in in the Christian God and in miracles and in salvation and in heaven is according to naturalism and science unreasonable. If you want, if you want me to say that my faith is unreasonable, according to your definition, I'll admit that it is unreasonable. It, it is something I choose to do, even though I haven't been uh, even, even though it can't be proven to be reasonable by your definition of reasonable. I'm okay. okay. That's fair. But so I'm still hung up on this thing. You say there is no line. Uh, Cause to me, there seems like there's a line for, I mean, science. yes, there's a line, but it's, it, but it's not like, it's not like I've got this much evidence and I need this much faith to get above the line for us. We're not trying to get above the line. Right. It's just faith. It's like, okay, I mean, I can point to things that I think are evidence for the existence of God. We talked about that last time. Um, but it's not like, oh, if only I had a little bit more. Or, you know, for me, the gap is this much that faith needs to fill in. It's not that faith is filling in the gap between unreasonable and reasonable proof. It's that the proof is icing on the cake if there is any, or the evidence is icing on the cake if there is any, but the, it's just, it's all faith. And I'm not worried about my faith coming up to a certain line. Right. And so like the atheist would say, the rational thing to do is to proportion your belief to the evidence. So you should only believe in so far as the evidence pushes you. And if the evidence pushes you above, you should believe and if it doesn't, you shouldn't believe. And you're saying, regardless of where this line is, you have faith. So you're going above here, no matter what. Um, yeah, Which I, mean, to... I mean, I kind of still want to reject the whole above and below thing, but yes, that is what I'm saying. It's like, if, if, the, if someone is going to say to me, well, your belief is disproportionate to the evidence, you believe too much relative to the evidence, I would say, yeah, I choose to. I choose to believe that much. Yeah, and I'm, yeah. okay with that. I'm super happy with it. No, that's where for me it says like you're agreeing. It seems like, it sounds like you're agreeing with the atheist. It sounds like you you you're saying that there. Well, except for the fact that I believe God exists and oh, that right. you can be in a relationship with God, um, you know, and and I and I believe that I am in a relationship with God. Even though sometimes I get mad at God, sometimes I get disappointed with God, sometimes I yell at God, but I believe He hears me when I yell at Him. You know. My name is James, right? That's in Hebrew, that's Jacob. If you know your Old Testament, Jacob is the guy who wrestled with God. I have wrestled with God. But and I never and stopped believing. Punched him in the punched him in the balls. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think I was the one who got punched in the balls. But anyway, um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm happy to admit that my my level of belief is disproportionate to the proof. 
I don't have a problem with that because I, because I don't, I don't need the proof. It's not about the proof. Right. right. Yeah, that's totally fair. So, and I it's just, about, it's about knowing in my own heart and soul that I am in this relationship with God, such as it is. And I'm, I'm no saint. I mean, you know, um, but, uh, but I do believe that the, you know, there are times when you pray and the answer is no. There are times when you pray and the answer is wait. There are times when you pray and the answer is complete silence and God's sitting there going, I'm not even going to tell you why I'm making you wait. And some of the most famous and most holy saints of our tradition have gone through periods, long periods in their lives when they felt God had completely abandoned them. Like, why would they have to go through that? I don't know. Right. But, but here's the thing, like, you know, there's, there's this classic argument from argument against the existence of God from, you know, evil or suffering. Like, so if, if there's evil in the world, there's suffering in the world. If God is really great, all powerful, and God is really good, all benevolent, then therefore there would be no suffering in the world. And there was even a famous book written a while back, why bad things happen to good people written by a rabbi. And he starts with this question, you know, if God is great and God is good, why is there evil in the world? And by the end of the book, if I remember, I wrote it many years ago, but by the end of the book, he basically comes to the conclusion that God really is as good as we think, but God isn't really as powerful as we think. And so there's evil in the world because God can't help it. Well, I don't accept that answer. I think, I think there's a third answer because, because this whole argument presents it like there's only two possibilities. One possibility is God is who we think he is, and he's, but, or he, God he's is powerful, but not as good, or he's not as good, but as powerful. Right, right. And I think that classic Christianity says there's a third option. God is as powerful as we think. God is as good as we think. But there are reasons why God allows things to happen that, that we can't understand. You know, I mean, there, there are, there are things God does we can't understand. And then there are also things that God allows but does not cause that we can't understand. Um, and uh, to me, that's the only answer to the question that doesn't, that, that doesn't require an arrogance on my part. Because, because I'm willing to say, I don't see the big picture. I'm willing to trust God and say, okay, I am not going to presume to make determinations about the existence or non-existence of God or the goodness or, or power of God, because I'm much smaller than God and I'm limited in my perspective and in my intelligence. And so I will take the, the road of humility and say, there are things about this, there are things going on here I don't understand, but I'm going to trust that God is good and that God is great and that you know, when it seems from my perspective that God is silent when I want God to act, or God uh, says no when I want God to say yes, that there are that there are reasons for that that ultimately are fi for for my own good. Why call that humility? Because to me that seems like the opposite of humility. Or just before I wanted to get into that, like you mentioned, uh, like the point of atheism isn't to claim God doesn't exist. The point, the main claim that most atheists make is that there isn't sufficient evidence for a God, and so that there's the line thing is below the line. That's the most claim atheists make. Sure, but you you do conclude from that that God doesn't exist. Otherwise, you'd yeah. be agnostic as opposed to atheist, right? Right. So same with like the Santa analogy. We think if the Santa is below the line, and anything below the line, you shouldn't proportion your beliefs to the evidence. Below the evidence, don't don't believe it, kind of thing. But yeah, so the main claim isn't that God doesn't exist; it's that there's no evidence, and that's why we don't believe. But to go back, why do you think that, or why do you call that? humble because to me if it said that seems like the opposite so like if somebody says i believe in a magical leprechaun who's going to stop the economy from collapsing or whatever and the economy collapses and you're going to be like well maybe he he has sufficient reason to allow the economy to collapse to me that seems like arrogance because to me the humble thing to do would be to follow the evidence wherever it leads and so if the economy collapses the humble thing is to say that falsifies my hypothesis. I should probably make a new hypothesis or like a scientist. If we're trying to analyze the evil problem and we say, what evidence would we expect if it was a perfectly good God, it probably wouldn't be 
worms that eat out the eyes of babies, uh, probably something we wouldn't expect to see. We do see that. So all the evidence seems to indicate the opposite of that God is all good. Is there any evidence to say that this unknown hypothesis is the case, or is that simply an ad hoc thing we're adding in to try to save our hypothesis? And it seems more like the ad hoc thing rather than we have any actual reason to believe that's the case. Well, I think the point we're missing here is that there's more we don't know than that we do. So even when you're, even if you're in a scientific mode and you're compiling all your evidence, right? And if you, you know, if there are five pieces of evidence that you have, well, there's 500,000 pieces of evidence you don't have. So, or, so, I mean, to me, and, you know, I mean, maybe it's stupid of me to like claim humility. I mean, but, but the point is, is that I'm at least acknowledging the fact that my perspective is limited and so therefore i um i choose to believe what again what you know is part of our tradition which is that there's a bigger picture here that i don't see and that at the end of the day god has created the best of all possible universes um in spite of the fact that there uh, there are, you know, there are instances of suffering. I mean, evil is, for the most part, evil is, is the result of free will. I mean, God gave people free will so that if anyone chooses to, you know, love God, believe in God, they'll do it by free will. But what that means is that they also have the ability to reject God and to do evil things and people do evil things every day. Um, but to take away the ability to do evil things is to take away free will and then people aren't free. And then, you know, so, I mean, you see, so, so there's that, but, um, but I mean, there is legitimate suffering in the world and, uh, and, and yet, um, you know, I think God's end game is not at the end of the day, our personal comfort in this life but our relationship with God that, you know, that results in union with God in eternity. So, you know, that's, that's the bigger picture there. Well, for me, it seems like I don't understand why that would be the more humble approach here. So like, well, don't get hung up on the humble thing. I mean, it's just sort of acknowledging that our perspective is limited and we don't well, I agree to. with that part. That part I really agree with. So I agree with the, the Thomas Edison quote, we only know one millionth of a percent of anything. So that part I agree with. But even if that's the case, um, which I think it is for both our perspectives, um, what is the correct decision to make here? Like it's possible that we're all in the matrix, right? We could all be in like a big computer program. We just don't realize it. But is yeah. that the rational conclusion to set, to make, to say like, you know, physics predicted all this stuff we would see. And we have these laws of physics that are really good and it, they work really well, but maybe we're, we're brain in the vat. And none of this stuff proves we're not in the brain in the vat. So is the brain in the vat a rational conclusion because it could be the case? No not really the most rational conclusion to think we're in a brain of that. Um, and so the same thing applies to like God here. It's, it seems like we have very good reason to think if there was an all good God, he wouldn't create worms that eat out the eyes of babies. We see worms that eat out the eyes of babies. So that seems to be evidence against God. So kind of like how you think that um, the historical te texts that say written down is evidence that there were unicorns or miracles or whatever. This seems to be evidence against God. Now you're saying, well, it could be the case that God have, might have some sufficient reason to allow this, which is possible. But do we have any reason to think that is true? It's possible, but is there any reason to conclude that? Is there any reason yeah. to conclude we're well, again, that? you know, that's a fair question. But I, I, I don't really think that the existence of suffering is evidence against the existence of God. It is certainly evidence that God allows suffering. But it doesn't, it's not evidence, I mean, it's an, it's an assumption that people make that says, if God is really all powerful and all good, therefore God would prevent suffering. That's an assumption that in itself is, I think, an unfounded assumption. But be that it is made, the point is, I don't think the existence of suffering is actually evidence because it's sort of, it's sort of evidence uh, or it's, it's making an argument from non-evidence, from the absence of evidence. Um, what do you mean? I'm lost a little bit. So to me, it seems like that would be good evidence. So like if there no, was because a... it's based on the assumption that, you know, if there's a God, this won't happen. It happened. Therefore, 
there's no God. And I think that's a flawed logic, you know, because well, the, it's modus ponens, but right. But the premise, it, the premise, if there's a God, this won't happen is a false premise. Why, so, why would you say that? So like, because for me, it seems like, well, just to, to expand the argument a little bit to me, it seems like if there was a perfectly good God, it would prevent evil, whatever evil is. And if it's possible to create a world without evil or with less evil, and that world did not occur, then the God must be evil to some degree. So like if I can imagine a world without worms that eat out kids' eyeballs, and that's a pretty easy world to right, imagine. Well, but let's separate evil and suffering, first of all. Oh, I agree on the suffering. So in my model, I think it's involuntary suffering is evil. Suffering on its own is fine. Like if you choose to suffer, if I choose to play a really hard video game that pisses me off, not immoral. Well, if you're, okay. it's forced on you against your will, that would be immoral. And so that's the part I would argue is the involuntary suffering. Right. But back up. If someone chooses to drive drunk, right, and causes someone else to suffer, kills someone, causes injury, right? That is involuntary suffering because the person who's suffering or the family of the person, you know, they are suffering for no fault of their own against their will. Yep. But it's still the result of the misuse of free will on the person who chose to drive drunk. So that's not on sure. God. I mean, that, that, that happens. Wait a minute. Of free Wait a minute. So that part is definitely on God. That's 100% on God because God designed the physics of the world. So like if I designed the physics of the world, I would make it so it's physically impossible to crash into somebody without their consent. So okay. it doesn't matter. You can sure. drive drunk as but, much as you want. It's physically now, impossible yeah, to crash into somebody. But now you've devolved into saying, you know, the reason I don't believe in God is because, because God isn't the way I would create God to be. Like, like because God doesn't exist in the image of the way I think God should be, therefore there's no God. You can't do that, all right? Well, it's, it's not, it's more specifically, here is a logically possible way the world could be, which is better. If a perfectly be, if a perfect being existed, it would maximize whatever the better standard is. Since it did not maximize the better standard, it doesn't exist. Right. But you have decided that you're the arbiter of what's better. Well, I'm using, that's, not your um, job. that's above well, I'm using evidence. So no. the, the standard of better I'm using is moral philosophy, which is anything in philosophy. And I'm looking at a pattern in moral intuition and moral progress, trying to assess what we would imagine the best world to be. Or we can also do an internal critique and look at like what heaven looks like, supposedly, and try to, can we get a world as close as possible to heaven without uh, infringing on free will? And the answer is, can it be closer to than this world? And the answer is yes. So we can get a world closer to heaven um, without infringing on free will. By yeah, giving no, I mean, now, see, now you're just playing that game where, well, you know, if I were God, I would make the world this way. And because I think that's best. And therefore, since God didn't make the world this way, there's no God. Well, no, no. So there's, there's two approaches there. One is that we can use independent evidence of morality to do that and say, well, we have a different, there's a different standard of morality. This one's better than the Christian one. And that's a one route to go. But the other route to go, if we can just look at the Bible, what does heaven look like? This is what heaven looks like. Can we get, can a world be created? that's like earth that is closer to that world and further away from this world, which would then be more moral because heaven is morally perfect, presumably. And so we could say if a world could be created, that's closer to heaven, then it would be a morally superior world. And if God didn't do that, but could have, then he can't be morally perfect. So we can use an internal critique in Christianity to say that if Christianity is right, yeah. no, I, I, heaven. I, I think there's so many flaws in that. I don't even know where to start. Um, because again, you know, you're presuming all these assumptions that, you know, you, you presume that somehow heaven, whatever that is, serves the same function as the universe we live in, and therefore they should somehow be more alike. You're assuming that, you know, that... Well, the, the only assumption there is, is heaven morally perfect? That's the only thing we're looking for. Is heaven morally perfect? No, the, the, you also have the assumption that you're saying there, that, that somehow it would be better if this world was more like what we think heaven is, that's an assumption too. And I don't, I don't think it's, it's valid. Well, uh, if by better, you mean more moral, I would agree. But so the well, question, is there any, is there any sin in heaven? Well, I, I assume, no, there's no sin in heaven. Right. So heaven is morally perfect. There's right. Close... But here's the problem, right? But this, the, so this world is not morally perfect. Heaven is morally perfect. This world is not morally perfect, right? 
but you can't you, you can't make this world heaven without taking away the free will part. Wait, wait, so so walk with walk through me with this step by step. Heaven is morally perfect. Our world is not morally perfect. So there's like a spectrum. There's a spectrum of morality. Heaven is at the uh, top. You know what? I'm going to stop you right there because because you are still putting yourself in the place of determining what is morally perfect, and you are using the same standard for heaven, and, and it, which you know we could do a whole show on on what that is. Well, this is, this is an, an internal simple. critique. So I'm trying to use the Christian standard without imposing mine at all. So I'm saying by the Christian standard, because obviously I don't think, I think heaven is terrible. Heaven sounds awful. I don't want to worship God at all. So from my perspective, heaven sounds awful. But in the Christian worldview, heaven is morally perfect. That's what I'm asking. In the Christian worldview, is heaven morally perfect? I, I mean, yeah, but I wouldn't use that language. And I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't assume that whatever, you know, whatever makes heaven morally perfect, uh, therefore also is the standard by which this world would be better if it was more like that. I think that's an assumption you're making and it's, and uh, you, yeah, I, I wouldn't. So I, I don't think this line of reasoning is going to get us anywhere because I think it's just, it's just based on, on these assumptions. Well, are, are, are you better and more moral are synonymous as far as I'm aware. But you, but, but you, more moral according to Christianity. No, I mean, we would have to have a whole conversation about what morality even is in Christianity, right? Okay, so in Christianity, is heaven, by Christianity's definition, is heaven more moral than earth? Okay, again, completely like problematic assumptions because morality is a function of a, of the way a person uses free will right so you could say one person is more moral than another because one person submits their will to the will of god more consistently or one person sins less than the other but heaven is not a person that can be more or less moral right the universe as god created it is not a person who can be more or less moral Right, the right. universe doesn't sin. Heaven doesn't sin. So, it, it, this is not working for me. This whole this whole line of reasoning is is not uh, right. So the, it's not. Sense. I'm not literally saying the location is moral. I'm saying the people in the location, the way they live, is more moral than the way we live. Their actions are more moral. They have less immoral actions, more moral actions. It's a comparison of the actions and motivations of the individuals who live there. Is that world? heaven, um, a more moral place for people to live? Are they more moral? Do they act more morally? Are there less immoral actions in that world, in yeah, this world? I think, you know what? I think I'm going to have to say that the whole concept of morality becomes a moot point in heaven. So it's not really even a category that, you know, that can be measured in that sense. Well, um, then doesn't that mean you can't say God is moral? Because if, if morality is a moot point in heaven, God is in heaven, and it's like an God is property is completely irrelevant now. Okay. I think I think you're you're getting outside your wheelhouse here because you're trying to uh, you know you're you're trying to do the job of a theologian in order to make an argument but you're not quite getting there. Um you know, we don't talk about God being moral, more or less moral. Um because God is because again, morality is the extent to which someone obeys God, submits one's will to the will of God, right? But God is God. So God is the standard. God is the one, you know, that we try to measure up to. It's, it's, so you, you can't say God is moral or not. Morality doesn't apply to God in that sense. And so you're applying, you know, it's like, it, it's like saying, you know, the oranges in heaven are better than the apples here on earth. You're comparing apples and oranges and it can't be done. It's not well, worth The question here is, does morality apply to the beings in heaven? And you're saying, no, morality does not mean anything in heaven, but that not, doesn't make any not sense. Not in the sense that it could be compared to morality in this life. That's the part I'm lost here. So if, if morality loses meaning in heaven, um, for all of the angels and 
beings in heaven. They just, morality just doesn't apply to them at all. But it somehow still applies to God. He's perfect. He's a perfectly moral being. Well, I know. It doesn't, now it just doesn't apply to any of the things in heaven. But then it applies to things on earth. This doesn't make any sense. It applies to people. Right. I mean, it is a category that can be applied to people. And, and but we're still people in heaven, right? Life. But after death, yeah, it's it, you're making a comparison that can't be made. You're trying to make a comparison that just can't be made. So anyway, let's move on to something else because that is just not working. Okay. I mean, apparently, we just we stop being people when we die. Is that we're, just, we're no souls? Um, I think. Uh, well, of course, you know, I can't speak from experience, but um, but those who are in the presence of God in the eternal realm are uh, in union with God to such an extent that, um, you know, the, these things are not an issue. Do we have free will in heaven? Well, I mean, you know, the, the, the story is, of course, that, the, that there was a sort of angelic rebellion, you know, pre-human history, and that Lucifer is the result of an angel using his free will to rebel against God. Um, beyond that, I don't know. I don't know what free will looks like in heaven. I, 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 have, I have no idea, you know. Okay. Um, to me, that seems... But, to... but the point is... The point is that the argument that, you know, if God is all powerful and all good, that, that there would be no suffering uh, is a flawed argument because we just simply don't have the big picture perspective. Uh, you know, at least this is, you know, what historic Christianity has taught. This is what I believe that, um, you know, to say, to say that, you know, God doesn't exist or God is evil because there's suffering in the world is just another way of saying that I have figured out what God should be like. And if God isn't like that, then either there isn't a God or I refuse to believe in the one that there is because I just refuse to worship a God who isn't the God that I think he should be. Well, it's more, again, an evidential kind of argument. So like, I obviously think it's a logical contradiction. So I think you can give, you can make a better world and give everyone free will without any involuntary suffering. And that's something we can create. So God should be able to create it. But hypothetically say- Are you sure? Yep, yeah, 100% sure it's logically possible. Okay. There's no logical contradiction. It's, it's and is there, is there any possibility that you could be wrong about that? That there no, could be something there's... you don't know that would make you wrong about that? No, because that would make it a logical contradiction. So there's as long as I no can show there's no... There's nothing, there's no possibility in the universe that you could be wrong about that. That would make it a logical contradiction. So for this to, this, the whole it, point of the claim is there is no logical contradiction with creating free will and no involuntary suffering. So yes, we can show that's the case very easily. No, that, um, that's not true because... If people have free will, they unfortunately have to be free to hurt other people. No, and if they're not free to hurt other people, they don't really have free will. Does Stephen Hawking have free will? Yeah, I, I, I believe. He's a paraplegic. He can't hurt anybody. Wait, he's dead, right? Well, yeah, he's technically yeah, dead. Yeah, so now. he knows But God when he was know. alive, he was a paraplegic. Yeah. Paraplegics can literally not hurt anyone. Oh, that's Do not, they have free will? That's not true. He could say hurtful words through his little computer and he could hurt somebody's feelings. Okay, when I say hurt, I mean physical. So words, words aren't immoral. You get on the internet and Kill. hire an assassin and, and, and have somebody killed. So, so again, the question here is, before the internet, people are paraplegic. There are literally cases where one human is completely incapable of harming other people. Does that mean he loses free will? Well, not entirely, but I mean, you know, what, what's the point of the, the exception proves the rule? I mean, you know, so, so what you, so you can point to individuals who have less agency than others. That doesn't take away free will. That's not the point. Right. So if every person was a paraplegic and was physically incapable of harming any other person, they'd still have equally the, amount, the same amount of free will. So you envision a universe 
a better universe than this one would be one where everyone is a paraplegic? No, I literally didn't say that. But I am so silly. I hate it when Christians say such a silly thing. Like, you just no. Said that. I mean, look. No, no, no. What I said is it's possible for everyone to have free will and to be physically incapable of harming others. The ability to physically harm others is irrelevant to free will. Free will is a psychological freedom. It doesn't matter if you're physically capable of doing things. Someone may be a short midget or whatever, physically incapable of harming someone that doesn't infringe on their free will. The physical limitations of a body doesn't infringe on, if I don't want to fly, say, I can't get up and fly, does that mean I don't have free will? No, your free will is the desire to do will. Free will does not mean the freedom to do everything. Yes. Free will does not mean unlimited freedom, right? But the existence of free will, if, if, if humanity is to have free will, it has to be free to reject God. Sure, by, that part I agree with. By rejecting God's commandments sure. and, you know, and God has commandments not to hurt other people. You know, apparently we have the free will to, to hurt other people. Okay, but so to say that to say that because we have free will to hurt other people, therefore God must not exist because it's I, I hear you saying it's logically possible to create a universe, you know, where no one can hurt other people. First of all, I don't think that's true. I don't think it's true that people could truly have free will and be limited to that extent. But even if you can envision such a universe. What makes you think that's a better universe than the one we have, right? You're just, you're just basing that on your own criteria and you don't have all the facts. Well, no, this, is, this is an objection to your argument. Your argument is, is that we must have free will um, in order for the universe to be better or whatever. And so well, it's yeah. logically possible to prove you can have free will and no suffering. So let's say we teleported each individual to a different planet. And it was impossible for them to have the resources to go to meet each other. Well, congratulations. Like their psychology is exactly the same. You have exactly the same free will in that universe as you do this one. So it's necessarily the case that everyone has free will, but can't hurt each other. But what, do you, easy by, what, what do you lose by teleporting to your individual planet? You have no human contact with anybody else, right? So you've got an issue. Yeah, no, because you have to understand, you know, maybe no, 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 it's possible to do what you say. But then you lose too much. You lose, no, you, you lose nothing. You lose nothing. Because again, oh. the point of a thought experiment is to isolate variables. We can make all of the social interactions still the same. We can give everything the same and just get rid of the involuntary suffering. It just takes a longer example. The point of this example is only to show you can have free will and no involuntary suffering. And here's an extreme example to show that that's very, very simple. So we can make a more complicated example. We can have all of the human interaction we have today. And it's impossible to murder someone. I, I don't think you can, no matter how complicated you make the example, right? The point is, is that God knows better than you what kind of universe to make. Well, no, that's, we can prove this false. So I can give every individual a universe. They can design it however they want. It's impossible to enter somebody else's universe unless they consent. You can just say it's murder is impossible in my universe. Anybody who enters my universe can't murder. It's a consensual relationship. They can all enter your universe. You have equally as much human interaction. So I just got, I solved the problem because this entire world, and I can prove I can solve the problem because I can make a world exactly like this one that we live in right now, exactly the same, same rape, same murder, same worms that eat baby's eyes out. And the only difference is to enter that world you have to consent to be there. So now everything in this world is possible in the world I'm describing because everything in this world is one of the possibilities in that world. So I now have logically proven that you can get rid of involuntary suffering by you just giving people the it. option. All you've proven is that you can invent a fantasy world in your mind. That's all you've proven. You have not Which, proven that that fantasy world is better than the one we live in. So, Again, so so the point here is there is no logical contradiction in a world without involuntary suffering. I can prove there's no logical contradiction because I can make it in my uh, mind. And so I, don't, a, I no, I I don't agree that you can prove that, but it doesn't matter even if you could because because what you're doing, you know, with these thought experiments is you are, you know, you are taking these like hypothetical. Um, examples and you're saying well because i can put a and b together in a sentence therefore there's no logical contradiction between them they can both exist in the same universe but you don't know that you, don't, just, you don't see the big picture so so logical contradiction is a technical term in philosophy it's in the syllogism that 
there's no A and not A anywhere in the argument. That's, that's sure. all it means. I get that. But the point is, is that that's not enough, right? I mean, what? that to, to show that there's no, you know, contradiction by the, by the rules of logic, philosophical logic, is not enough to say, to be able to say that I know this universe would be better than the one we have. And because God created the one we have instead of, or because we, because the one we have exists and not this better one that I know about in my mind, therefore God can't exist because if God did exist, he would have created the one that I, that I created in my mind. I mean, that's just, it's, it's, I'm trying to avoid judgmental words. It's, a certain kind of fantasy. Well, again, so that the point of this argument is to show that is it possible to create a world with free will and without involuntary suffering? Is it logically possible? I don't the answer is it. yes. Saying no. it's better doesn't matter. Who care? I don't care if it's better. Is it logically possible to do this? The answer is yes. No, I is don't. It better? You can you can make up whatever I better. I don't care because because that kind of free will wouldn't really be free will. How? And I mean, you know, because because you wouldn't have the ability to decide to love someone the way or wait, you, wait, that would be the same no. that would be exactly the same no, you're in this just universe. saying oh but i would put that in there no you don't get to do that you don't get to just what? create a fantasy universe and say that it's possible right wait. not possible to have free will wait, wait, wait. You and also, arbitrarily saying that here's something i really like and it can't exist in your universe because i don't like your universe that's all you're saying so no, why would love no, not just, be possible? Well, I'm critiquing what you're saying because you're saying that I can envision a universe where people have free will but can't yeah. harm each other. Yes. And Physically. I'm saying that wouldn't be free will. How? So in this world, you said love isn't possible. You can go into someone's world and be in a relationship and marry them and be in their house and spend time with them exactly the same, but somehow love isn't real. It makes no sense. I think it makes perfect sense. How? Because what, what is the missing property in here that isn't love? I can't stab I can't stab my partner in their sleep. Is that is that the missing property that makes it not well, really? Well, I mean, you you know that would be an extreme example, right? But the fact that you can stab your partner in this in her sleep, and the fact that you don't, it says something, right? That you are using your free will not to do that, right? Okay, but that's not a property. If you don't have the ability to harm someone then choosing not to harm them is not something you can choose either. Right, you, so Stephen Hawking could not have choose harm. to stab his wife. Does that mean right. he doesn't the love point her? Is, if you can't choose to harm someone, you also cannot choose not to harm them. So when you don't harm them, that's not, that's not real love because you're not doing it out of free will. That's not what love means. Love, do, love doesn't mean I'm choosing not to harm you. That's and not that's what love part is. part of what love means. No, it's not. Sure, because because if I'm married, if I if I say something mean and hurtful to my wife, right? I mean, obviously, I'm not gonna. You can still all the words, all the words are still available. You can still say mean things. You just can't literally stab them. <laughs> okay, so so you're you're limiting the uh, involuntary suffering to physical violence. Yes. Okay, but what about the involuntary suffering that is the result of psychological violence? If what if someone's want... in, a, in an abusive relationship where they're ne they never get hit, but they're verbally abused on a daily basis? If they choose to be in that relationship, it's consensual. So if, if they don't want to be in that oh, relationship, dude, they can leave. Don't even go there. You're gonna, if we had comments now, no, no, no. you would be getting comments from people. In my world, not say you get your, in, in my world, like, my example, you get your own universe. You can leave at any time you want by snapping your fingers. Every person has this ability in the universe I'm describing. So yeah. in this world, if they don't like the relationship, they can choose to leave whenever they want. Yeah, but no one can stop them. You have created a fantasy universe. No, and God could create this with ease. All, any all-powerful being could create this with ease. There's no logical contradiction. That, it proves that, that is true. However, the assumption that God should have done that is a false assumption. I didn't say that at any point. The argument here yeah, is- Yeah, but you are assuming it? that because, no. because you're, saying, you're saying that, you know, if, if God didn't create a world without this involuntary suffering and, and God should have, that, there's, that, that therefore God doesn't exist. 
Well, two, two separate questions. So, so the first question is, is it logically possible to create a world with free will and without involuntary suffering? The answer is yes. Is it better is a separate question. That's not a, the, the, whole, the whole point of this argument is just that. to say, I think, I think I've answered this. I mean, I think, you know, we could go round and round, but I, I think I've answered this as, as, as much you as answered it with a non-answer. You keep saying a false thing. Like this is saying that it's better. Like, no, it's not. It's completely irrelevant. I'm saying whether this is better or not doesn't matter. I'm saying that you that that in your fantasy universe, you have compromised free will. That's not real free will. Right. And that's so, the question I keep asking about, but you haven't answered. So how? Because in this I world I explained it. Because be, plus you're just limiting involuntary suffering to physical suffering. And there's, right. you know, the whole gamut of psychological suffering and people right. saying hurtful words, you, you know. No, that's you, also Every voluntary. time I make an objection, you're refining your fantasy a little bit, but it's still a fantasy. No, right? this has been refined in detail in all of my previous videos, I'm so I'm changing sure, nothing. Yes, I'm sure you guys have worked on this really hard, but it's all bullshit. Look, at the end of the How, day- you, you, you say that, but you provide no evidence. So what is the problem with having a universe where every person has their own universe, they can design it however they want, and you can choose to try to enter somebody else's, and if they allow it, you can enter. Then all of your words are consensual. You've consented How to a you ever... region. I don't know. I mean, I, I can't play dueling fantasies with you, but, but that's not free will. That's not love. And it's clearly not the universe that God designed. At the end of the day, the bottom line is this, right? There is this third option to the so-called dilemma of the existence of evil and suffering, which is that we don't know the whole story. We don't have the big picture. And there are reasons why God created this as the universe that exists. And there are reasons why God doesn't prevent all uh, suffering. And we, we aren't always going to know what those reasons are. I get that that answer is not satisfying to you. I get that that answer is not based on evidence for you. But that, that is the answer. It's all, that is the answer. Well, it's, it's not, and that's the point is that we it can is. prove it's not, it's, it's, but Christians can't answer. It's not, it's not an answer you like, but it is. Well, the no, 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 the objection here is that you're literally not answering the question. You're avoiding the answer. So the, like, no, I the mean, reason... I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not claiming to have evidence. Well, no, 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 that's, so the question here is like, I keep trying to say, here is a way that we can show a world with free will is possible that doesn't have involuntary suffering. I never said this was better. I don't care if it's better. It's irrelevant. But I, but I said to you, that doesn't work because it's not real love and it's not real free will. And it, as far as I can tell, it wouldn't work. Now, look. Wait, wait, I, I can say the same thing and say a world that God created is not real love. No free will is possible. I can just say those things, but that isn't evidence. You're not answering the question. You're just saying, I, I like don't it. like it. I'm claiming not to have, I'm, I'm literally claiming not to have all the answers. Right, but you're saying it's impossible for this. I have no evidence for this claim. I just don't like it. No, no, Therefore, I mean, it's impossible for this to be love. This can't be love. This can't be real love. There can't be any love. free will because I don't like it. That's all you're saying. Not because I don't like it is because it's not consistent with, you know, our scriptures what? and our tradition. Right, you don't like it. That's it. That's all you're saying. Like, no, what? I'm saying There's as a historian and as a theologian, it is not consistent with what we already know about what love is and what free will is and who God is. So right, you're only based off universe, of your, your fantasy universe would itself be a logical contradiction with what we already know about God. Right. So you don't like it based off of your scripture and your predetermined definitions, which have no basis in reality. But if we're looking at scientific oh, they, definitions of love, they have every at, basis in my reality. Sure, but if we look at any measurable definition of love that we know about that has a, we have a reason to believe it outside of imagination, that is possible in this universe. Everything we experience in this world right now is possible in this universe I just described. So you can't say it's impossible. You can't do it. It, it, because it doesn't, yeah, it, it doesn't work. It's, it, it wouldn't. Again, you can't, you can't say it. I am that. saying like, it. Hear me saying it. Based on everything I know, and I have a PhD in this exact thing, right? The history and theology of Christianity. Based on everything I know, the fantasy universe you describe does not have free will or real love. It wouldn't work. Now, I could, you know, God knows 
God has his reasons why he didn't create your universe. I'm not presuming to know for sure. I'm Let just saying. Just, I want to focus on that a little bit. So let's say we have world A, this world, the world we live in has free will and love, right? Killing me. Well, go ahead. So, so our world right now has love and free will. It does. Right? Yes. Okay. So now let's say we make up another world where it has exactly our world plus a different one. Does that world have love and free will? No, because if it's plus a different one, it's not exactly our world anymore. You change. Oh my God. You don't get to change it. You're not God. Stop playing God with your thought experiments. Just, I mean, if you want to build a fantasy world, write a book. This is, this is not how it works. So, so, so in here with, with, you know, um, a sort of vague knowledge of, 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 I'm so lost right now. Like we have, Option A, this world, and that's all there is. Option B, you can choose to go to this world or you can go somewhere else, but now it's, everything's lost. No love, no you, free will, ah, but it's the same right. thing. You can choose it, but then you've lost all of those. So every individual gets to choose between these universes. How would they choose? How would they know which one to choose? God can give them minds and knowledge. He can snap his fingers and give them, he can say, uh, year 2022, everyone has this brain, so we're just going to give them that brain and that knowledge, and now they can choose. Yeah. God can give them an iPad and say, here, select your preferred preferences. There's infinitely many ways to do that, but none of that matters to the question. The question was this. Here is one world, our world, which we both agree has love and free will. I don't, free will, love and free will, has love and free will. And all I'm doing is taking exactly this world making it optional. You could choose to go here and have all of those things, or you can choose to go to a different world. And you're saying now it's magically lost love and free will. Just giving someone the option to choose universe B and magically love and free will are just gone now. That makes no sense. Well, I mean, you have to give people the free will to choose between, between universe A and universe B. That's right. Sure. Right. Keeping in mind that the purpose of the universe is to prepare people for union with God. Right. Okay. That is the purpose of the universe. Right. Sure. So, you know, you, now you have to, now you would have to, and I don't want you to, now you'd have to go into detail about describing universe B and how it's different and how people know which one to choose. Why does that matter? It does. Like like, it like does. It you matters. can make it literal hell. Just make it say you can choose universe B is spikes in hell and mashing of teeth. I well, don't care. I mean, Why but just saying you can like, pick universe A. On, now you've stumbled on the truth because that is exactly, that is exactly the reality. We live in this world and you get to choose between heaven and hell, right? No, now we're, you we're not talking about, said, talking about earth, earth and hell. So earth, our current earth, living here on earth. The only thing I'm saying is different is you can choose to live here on earth and go through a life of cancer, death, rape, whatever, all of the stuff, all of the love, the free will stuff, it's all in this earth. Or you can choose universe B. And it doesn't matter. Anything could be in universe B. It doesn't matter what's in universe B. Giving people the option to go to universe B somehow magically destroys love and free will, even though they could choose to go to the universe that has supposedly yeah, love because, and free will. Yeah, because universe B, if universe B is the same as universe A, then there's no point in the choice. If universe B is different from universe A, then I would argue that whatever you're going to do to universe B to try and get rid of you know, your involuntary suffering is going to destroy love and free will. Yes. It makes no sense. So, no, so, it, it so makes perfect sense to me. I mean... It, it, it makes perfect sense to me, but, but, but at the bottom line is, regardless of whether anybody thinks, you know, that, that I'm right about that, the point- wait, wait, wait. I, wanted, the, I wanted to pick up on this really, really quick. So you agreed that if universe, universe A is just our God Christian earth, universe B is the God Christian earth plus a different option. That's, so this is the two universes that we have. And now if universe B had two options, and they were both exactly the same as this one, you would agree they both have love and- Free will, right? I guess if it's exactly the same. Okay, now, now if I, if there's two options, and one of them would get rid of all that stuff, one of the options still has love and free will, doesn't it? Theoretically. So this option B, this option B universe, still has love and free will in that one place, and you can just choose to ignore it, right? Well, right, but the point is, is that for those people who would choose, for those people who would not choose it, it would destroy love and free will. So, so the whole argument here is that in this alternate universe I've created, 
love and free will still exist because this world we live in is one of the options. Right. But unless everybody is in that option, then there's a subset of people who don't have love and free will. Th that's fine. That's fine. Because the only point of the argument, the only point is just to say we can still have love and free will because I'm taking this exact universe as it is, designed by God, and saying this is one of the options. Therefore, anything in this universe is possible in my universe. That's the whole point of the argument. It's nothing else. It's just saying that everything in this universe is one of the things in mind that you can choose. But for those who didn't choose it. That's fine. Don't would, choose it. I don't care. That's not part of the argument. Yeah, look, love and free will have to be available to everyone. Or They can all choose it. Anybody can choose it. It's there. It's an option for everybody. Since when do people know what to choose that's best for them? Look, again, this that's whole the argument. experiment is, is pointless. It's completely pointless. It's, a, it's an exercise in fantasy world building, but so what? Let me so, just... So I think we I think we need to wind down here because we've been doing this for two hours and I and I I'll tell you up front I'm going to edit out some of this circular stuff but but so send me an un, uh, unedited one please because I can I'll use it all well we'll see the the point is okay let me end with this indulge me for a moment and assume God exists what do you want to say to God what would you say to God. I would verbatim quote Stephen Fry and be like, why child cancer? You are a monster. You destroyed all of these lives. You created such a miserable planet. What are you doing? You're so incompetent. That's what I would say. All right. Well, I can guarantee you this. God would rather have you say that to him, believing he hears you, than ignore him. So, all right. I think we need to quit. Um, but uh, once again, thanks for the conversation. Um, and uh, apart from the uh, fantasy problem, I think we had, we actually had some good conversations. So um, I don't well, know. I actually think that part was really important because it did, you did actually end up agreeing that it was possible. Love and free will were possible in my world was kind of the point. But not, mm -hmm. not if they're not, if not, if everybody doesn't have them. It's got to be all, it's got to be everybody. Everybody has to have free will and everybody has to, has to have access to real love. Otherwise, even because, I mean, look, people every day use their free will to sort of abdicate their free will. I mean, people do that all the time, but they always have the, they always have the chance to come back to God. If you create option B, where you say, okay, you know, uh, we're going to have this universe that has a limitation on free will, right? You're going to create a world where people, you know, are not able to believe in God out of real faith, you know? Well, if free will is somehow a law of physics, then I guess that makes sense, but it doesn't. I never said it was a law of physics. It's, it's metaphysics. It's beyond physics. It can't, right, so, it's not a thing that can be answered by science. Well, because the only thing I'm limiting is physical interactions. That's it. So if it's not a law of physics, then it can't limit free will. Yeah, but. yeah but, but that, you know, that in itself limits real love and real community it doesn't and make any sense. interaction. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, at the end of the day, we could all be in upload you know, um, but great example. So if we all upload ourselves to consciousness, is love now free will? Are they gone? Do they, do they dissolve away in the universe now? If we're all in the, it, in the, it depends what the parameters are on the upload program. I mean, I, I've seen, I've watched the show, and I like it, but I don't. Um, well, would we be able to like overwrite God's free will and love through programming? Can we just like, nope, we're just going to delete those from human existence well, because we uploaded maybe, consciousness? Maybe, or maybe, you know, I mean. You remember, remember in the Matrix, right? Remember how the first version of the Matrix, everybody was happy. And what happened? They all went insane. And then they had to change the Matrix so that, so that there were flaws in people's lives. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you're going to, you, you, if you upload everybody into your fantasy world, 
they're all going to go insane. But I, of course, I yeah, don't. Yeah, because believing the story in the Matrix has evidence that that's truly going to happen. I don't think that's a great, great plausible explanation. Well, it's as plausible as your fantasy universe. I mean, you know, we could, we could actually have a, a discussion about what heaven is like and what that means and, uh, and all of that. But, um, but that's, a bigger, that's a bigger issue. All right, well, I'm going to let you go. Um, thanks again for the conversation. And, uh, you know, who knows, maybe we'll do this again. So, yeah, thanks again. Appreciate the opportunity. And yeah, please just upload like an unedited one because the more time watches better for analytics and stuff. And so, but yeah, thanks again. Talk to you later. All right. Talk to you later. See ya.